Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Greenlee, and I am a senior front end developer for Fresh Chill Soa. And today, I will be presenting to you guys performance optimization for the mobile web. Before I start, um, out of curiosity, how many of you guys uh, in here are developers? Designers? It's, it's very awesome. Well, you guys will love this because this is pretty development heavy. Is that happening for you? <laughs> it's going to just work. Start a presentation button. Oh, is it? All right, so today we're going to cover uh, a brief overview of the mobile web um, and its experience with users right now. Then we're going to go over the much dreaded testing, measuring, and debugging of the mobile web. And then we're going to move on to web performance optimization in areas where you can use some of the latest HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript to make your websites faster. And then we're going to uh, take a sneak peek into what's coming um, it's very exciting for the mobile web. Um, a lot of the new web APIs that will allow, uh, for the first time, mobile devices to access native features. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, all right. So the mobile web, it's been out for about more than a decade, and it is still very slow. That's why you guys are here. It's that slow. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. <laughs> Mobile web users, they're fed up. Um, it takes, the average website loads within five seconds. And uh, they've done all these studies to indicate that after about four seconds, people leave mobile websites. So if your site's taking longer than four seconds, you probably have a pretty high bounce rate. So everybody's fed up about this. In fact, there's something called mobile rage. <laughs> and mobile rage is how people react to when their web page loads slow. And it's, it's pretty funny. 4% of people throw their phones because <laughs> their experience is so bad. Um, a little percent, they scream at their phones. 23% curse at their phones. And 62% act pretty normally. <laughs> Now, why is the mobile web slow? Does anybody know why? Private networks. Networks? That's one reason. Anybody else? Processors. Processors is another good one. Too much data that they're pushing. Content. Content. Yep. So many external references. <laughs> Sorry? Poor optimization. Exactly. Do many layers before the processor. Right on. These are all really good answers. Load um, balancing the tower. Sorry? Load balancing the tower. Yep, that's, a, that's another good uh, reason. The thing is, the mobile web's pretty complicated, but ultimately, someone back there, I think, said it best. It's slow because, because of us. Uh, with all of the performance optimizations that are out there and, and where the mobile web's at now, um, especially with like the JavaScript V8 engine and some of the new HTML5, CSS3 uh, capabilities that are out there, the web can now, for the first time, I think, uh, meet the expectation of its predecessor, the desktop. By the way, may I suggest that instead of saying mobile web as it would be a different web altogether, we, I'd rather use the term web or mobile because it's still, I'm not saying it's all the same, one web is a wonderful dream, but. But then you have to optimize that and take a word yeah. <laughs> No, 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 but, you know, understanding that, that actually it's semantics maybe, but it has some I think, implications. Uh, when people talk about mobile web, we ended up with WAP, which nicely rhymes with, uh, and that 
that's why we had to start over again a few years ago. I, I hear you on that. Um, I don't know if I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just a point. Yeah. Um, so I guess the next thing is. Mobile web is slow because we are doing it wrong. And so what I plan to do by the end of the session is, is tell you guys some of the key ways uh, to improve the performance and optimization of websites, um, as well as uh, ways to test, debug, and optimize your website. But as you guys have all said earlier, it's, it's complicated to why the web is slow. And I'm going to try to describe it to you in one slide. Um, so first you've got a bunch of different carriers. These aren't all of them, um, but these are the popular ones. And between the towers and the carriers, you have different proxies, uh, latency, different bandwidths amongst the character, uh, different carriers. You also have, and again, these aren't anywhere near how many devices there are out there, but you also have tons of devices, tablets, smartphones, feature phones. All of these devices in themselves also have different screen sizes, resolutions, different behaviors in the way the sensors interact. Um, and they also interpret HTML5 and web sem semantics differently. And then, on top of all that, you have different operating systems. You've got WebOS, iPhone, iPad, Android, Windows 7, Symbian, Linux, and again, there, there are a bunch more, but these are the popular ones. And then, just for fun, throw it all in the mix, we have hundreds of mobile browsers, but these are the most popular mobile browsers that are out there right now. So it's complicated. There are a lot of factors to to take into account when working with the mobile web. When I first jumped into mobile web, and I realized this, part of me was excited because I had come from a, a desktop-only mobile or a web experience. And when I jumped into mobile, the first thing that bugged me was how hard it was to, to debug, test it, but also all the different variables that were out there. This is exactly kind of what I looked like right when I figured that out. But I'm here today to help turn your frown upside down. <laughs> okay. It's all about speed. And before we get to speed, you must first know some of the latest, I think, techniques and tools to best measure and test and then target and hone exactly where optimization needs to happen on your website. And, and there's not any one place or any one area. Uh, you've got to come at it at different fronts. And I'm going to explain all those to you. So there are four ways are four areas that I'm going to touch on for mobile debugging and measuring and testing. Um, I'm going to start off with emulators. Now, emulators are 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 good for the first test run. They're they're good for layout. They're good for seeing the overall design, but they are not that great for mimicking how the hardware will actually interact and how the hardware will process any uh, mobile site that you have. So emulators are really good mainly for 
debugging or coming out with your initial uh, draft or prototype. Um, so I try to stay away from the emulators um, and actually do the real devices. Real devices, you cannot beat. Nothing beats the real thing. Next are remote labs. Now, remote labs, I, I think, are way better than emulators because they actually, there are several ways they, they have this configured, but Samsung has a remote lab where they actually tie into the actual hardware devices for these mobile devices. So you can actually see the real time data and you actually see the screen resolution as it is on the machine. And all of this can happen remotely. And when you log in, you can actually sign up and check, check off different phones that you like to test everything on. Um, because they're actually using hardware devices, you've got to check out, so there's like a rental time period where you check it out, and then you can test your, your mobile sites that way. It's a really, really efficient way for going about testing a lot of devices because um, the offering they have there for devices you can test on is quite huge. Mostly Samsung devices. Um, Nokia has one too. Um, and then there's also these other companies. There's Browser Stack, which we use at Freshfield Soil. Um, that one's a paid service. I'm not quite sure what it is. Device Anywhere, it's kind of the same. Um, and then Perfecto Mobile does pretty much the same thing, except for they offer uh, all the devices, and also they offer a uh, desktop platform testing as well. Remote browser tools. Not too many browsers have All right, so not too many browsers have built in remote debugging tools. Uh, Opera does. Chrome has recently came out in Firefox as well, about a year ago. They came out with a way to do it via USB. Um, it's actually gotten a lot better. I would actually say it's probably one of the better ways to go about remotely debugging your device, but then again, you also have to have the actual device um, connected to your computer. And uh, that gives you all the tools uh, that are available for in the console for uh, debugging tools like on desktop computers. And then we've got real devices. And debugging on real devices can be really tricky, especially if you're dealing with data and passing over objects, um, dealing with uh, several resources. Uh, and one of the best ways I've found, um, is anybody here familiar with Charles Proxy? Awesome. Charles Proxy is the best thing that I've ever found because it enables you to see the stream of data as it goes from your mobile phone to the server. Um, you can also record it. You can um, go back and it's, it's everything uh, related to the network and how the resources are handled. And uh, it gives you a really, really good insight on how to um, hone in on where to optimize your site. Um, some of the other ones are WinRay and Adobe Shadow. They're pretty much the same thing. In fact, if you download and install Adobe Shadow, you see the WinRay logo on there. And so what this is, is it's a remote uh, JavaScript testing tool that allows you to, on your desktop machine through Chrome browser, um, actually debug using the console on the Chrome browser. And what you'll be seeing in that uh, console is what will be on the mobile device. However, you are still limited in uh, not having the ability to do things such as um, breakpoints or uh, really kind of any fine tuning or editing with the HTML like you can on desktop browsers. Now the fun part. <laughs> Areas of optimization, uh, mobile's web's best friend. 
uh, this HTML5. HTML5, uh, I, I believe, will revolutionize how web pages are delivered. Um, a lot of the, the features that you had to program in JavaScript um, is now taken care of uh, for you with HTML5 and CSS3. And so the more you use these, uh, the faster your web pages will be, the smaller they'll be, um, and also the smoother the inter experience will be for the users. So I've got some examples here. Um, some of the, the, the best practices in way of making your web page load faster is, uh, first of all, putting the style sheets at the top of the page. Um, and what this does is, style sheets do not block parallel loading of scripts. Uh, JavaScript does. So if you see this example right here, um, you see that the request takes 300 milliseconds longer. And that's primarily because you have JavaScript files that are being loaded at the beginning of the page rather than at the very bottom of the page. So you can see a significant time savings simply just by rearranging your scripts on your page. Yes. On mobile devices, typically how many parallel connections are there? That's a good question. Um, on mobile devices, it depends on the carrier. Uh, but typically, there are two to four uh, parallel connections that are the maximum. Uh, but there are tricks around that, and I'm going to show you that right now. If I can do this up. There you go. All right, so um, as the gentleman in the red right here was saying, uh, he, he, had, he had asked, how many connections can you have? while downloading resources at the same time. And you can usually have two to four, depending on the mobile network. If you use different domains, uh, even subdomains, um, you can actually uh, up that number to two to four per subdomain. And then it's also recommended uh, that if you're going to do this concurrent downloading, that you don't do it with more than four domains, simply because there's a certain point to where you'll get a penalty for a time penalty for having uh, making multiple connections, and the connection time takes takes a bit of time. More ways to make your web page faster: uh, minify your JavaScript, uh, minify your CSS. Uh, you can do these online. Just Google uh, online JavaScript minifier, online CSS minifier. And what this basically does is it reduces uh, the amount of code that the web page, the mobile device, has to parse and then execute. And so that saves time. But also you have a huge time savings uh, over the network. And mobile networks work 10 times slower than your desktop networks. GZIP your components. Uh, you do this on the server side um, by setting the headers. Um, GZIP does pretty much the same thing. It compresses the file size to, to make it so that the web page can parse and then execute the script faster. You want to reduce the number of HTTP requests. Again, um, requests from mobile devices to servers, uh, to, I'm sorry, through the network and through the carriers take 10 times longer because some of these carriers have proxies that the signal goes through. Um, also, it just depends on your strength, too, your mobile strength, um, what kind of mobile uh, uh, bandwidth you have. Are you 2G, 3G, Edge, LTE? You should always avoid redirects from mobile websites. I see a lot of companies um, come in, and what they'll do is they'll create a separate mobile website. And in a lot of cases, this redirect ends up taking a decent amount of time. It takes, I think, 1.8 seconds for that redirect to happen because the connection has to be reinitiated with the server. Um, so um, avoiding redirects can help you not get past that for a second threshold where people want to do their phones. Um, 
use local storage. Uh, local storage and application cache is their new features to HTML5. I love them. Uh, the reason why I like them so much is because not only do they enable your website to load faster, um, and the initial hit that you do end up loading uh, all of the scripts, so it still takes some time. But for some weird reason, uh, when you use application cache, um, you're able to download concurrently more scripts at a time than normal. And part of this is because it happens in the background. Also, with local storage and application cache, your mobile application will work offline, so you don't have to worry about the always connectedness of, of it all. Make <laughs> a quick comment. Uh, in the bygone days of my youth, uh, a few years ago, that is, I used to work with W3C uh, in the Mobile Web Best Practices Group. And we ended up producing two documents that may be a bit dated for some, maybe not, that was sort of pre-HTML5, as whatever that means today. Uh, but uh, I think we managed to put together a few, few dozen good do's and don'ts uh, that probably people here may, some of them are fairly elementary, but I saw some that sort of, you know, refer back to what we did. So. If you have nothing better to do, look up mobile web best practices on W3C websites. There are all kinds of, uh, you know, summary, shorter versions, longer versions, and both for the content and the mobile and the applications. Um, and uh, I think it's a good point to start because what I'm seeing out there today, uh, I mean, things change pretty slowly, and there are some things that people do, you know, on the server side that they should would make our life much easier if they wouldn't do it, or if they, if they would do things differently. Sorry about the lengthy uh, comment, but oh, no, no, I still think it's, it's you know, worth... Some things have been discovered and done already, and we seem to be sometimes going in a loop. And uh, as I said, good, good, very common sense practices that if, uh, would help if we follow them. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, I, I liked that site. Were you, were you part of the... The group who made that? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, I take all the blame. <laughs> all right. Um, with HTML5, uh, there, there's a lot of markup that I see out there that people still use that you don't really need to use. Um, some of this includes uh, like closing your, your, your BR tags, for example. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of people go div crazy and use a lot of layers and a lot of divs. And mobile, the more divs you have, um, and, and actually the more you nest them, the slower the rendering is for a brand animation, also the slower the rendering is for the page itself. So you want to try to stay as simple as you can with the, with the markup. Um, and also I'd encourage you to use some of the new HTML5 markup um, for accessibility. Um, some of this mark includes the article tag, section tag, nav tags. Um, you can Google this, the list goes on. But um, a lot of the benefits with using these tags are that they, some of these tags, and I'll show you the next slides, have uh, inbuilt uh, features about them that typically you'd have to program with JavaScript. So uh, something you can use with a simple tag um, now would take I would say like 20 lines of JavaScript to, to accomplish. So leverage HTML5 and CSS3 tags where possible. What's really cool is um, CSS3 and HTML5 degrade gracefully. Uh, so don't worry about that. Uh, I, and I, I say don't worry about that most of the time. Uh, there are those cases. Also, it's very important to make your site mobile friendly. And, and that's adding the mobile view port tags um, and the meta tags. Um, for iOS users, this is a pretty cool feature because if you couple this with offline storage, you can actually save uh, the mobile website on your device as if it's an app. And they call that a web app. Um, and <laughs> And it stores it locally, and you can have an icon, and so, so it can be like a whole application that can run offline as well. Pretty cool feature. 
All right, so here's some of the new markup and semantics that I told you about. In this particular example, you've got the new details and summary box. And if you see here, when you click on this information area right here, the summary, this box expands and closes automatically. So, so it typically would take you know, JavaScript or, or CSS. You can now just do with simple use of some of the new markup. And this already works on the mobile devices now. Here's some more. Again, just reiterating the point that a lot of the, the fluff that goes along with uh, highlighting or doing any of these functionalities um, can be saved um, simply by using and, and exploring some of the HTML5 features that are out there. Here is another one. I, I like this one. This is my favorite one because I like math. But basically, um, you've got the range, the range input, and you've got the number input. And here you can spit out using the output tag the results slot as you're, you're you're moving around with this little dial right here. And that saves again tons of JavaScript, um, uh, DOM manipulation, all of that fun stuff. It's taken care of for you right here in HTML5. Now on desktop, um, desktop's main name isn't, I would say, similar as it is in mobile with regard to trying to reduce the number of requests um, for speed. Um, so, so one of the tasks that you're typically told to do on desktop is to externalize your, your CSS sheets, externalize your JavaScript uh, sheets. Um, in this case, and also have images, uh, resources on uh, in your directory. With mobile, one of the recommended techniques are to use data URIs. And data URIs are the base 64 encoding of images. Um, and you should use those primarily for smaller images, uh, logos, uh, arrows. Um, and is, is every is anybody here not familiar with Base64 URIs? Raise your hand. Cool. Everybody knows about this. Nice. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, with some of the newer web APIs that are coming out um, for mobile, which I'll show you at the very end of this, uh, you're able to take these um, Blobs, uh, and you're able to real time capture from your, your device pictures and you can send them using some of the, the newer APIs. And I'll show you that to review. SVG. SVG is awesome. Um, this is uh, using creating a text path with SVG. Um, this feat would be very, very difficult to do um, with CSS, JavaScript alone. Uh, but now you've got the, the magic of SVG in the DOM. And you've got it here again. And with doing this inline SVG, you can actually see the difference between the images. You got, this is using a JPEG, so it's like a grainier image. This is using uh, SVG. So you can see the difference in quality um, without having to download a whole image. For all animations that you do on mobile, wherever possible, use CSS3 transforms. CSS3 transforms are very, very powerful in that they take advantage of the GPU within devices, and that accelerates the, the graphics. Um, it makes the user experience uh, a lot smoother, and the, Uh, and, and consistent amongst all devices. Cool. Now we're moving on to the future of the mobile. And so I'm going to show you some links. Any questions before I move on? So this all sounds great, but how do you balance the need to, to, to 
felt this way, the local will really need to support browsers that don't support this stuff yet. Like, uh, do, do, do we have multiple kinds of, like, do we have like two different versions, one for mobile, one for not? Do we, do we, what, what should we be? That's a good question. Um, well, I, part of that is under circumstance. Uh, my recommendation is to start off with a mobile first approach and to, to design the website so that it is responsive, um, so that as your screen size gets smaller, the images uh, realign themselves. Um, uh, fluid design is huge, and I think if you do it right, it'll work both on mobile and, and on desktop. Did I answer your question? It's a good start, but like, like, like uh, using these new new market tags, for instance, the ones that all the browsers don't support. It, do we just not use them and continue to do what we've been doing, or like, what, where do you draw that line? Like, how do you balance? Like, how do multiple uh, multiple copies of your code base, some for mobile and some not for mobile? I see what you mean. Well. Uh, a lot of the, the what I've been reading online uh, is all about forgetting the old, uh, uh, and the way that a lot of these libraries degrade and CSS degrades. Uh, the difference is, is barely noticeable. Um, I mean, for example, like CSS three, like rounded corners, it just be squares on uh, unsupported devices, and a lot of these uh, the features like the output, for example. Um, something like that might be broken. Uh, I recommend uh, going online and looking at compatibility charts um, to see what is compatible right now. Um, I've seen that, that, that circumstance happen many times, and typically the companies uh, do a fine mix of using the new um, and understanding how the new code degrades uh, so that the user experience isn't impacted. <clears throat> yes. Uh, what what about the things and body fields like you know, modernizer or CSS five kind of help uh, like all the browser to support new technologies in the experience? I'm sorry, say one more time. Using body fields like you know, modernizer or uh, CSS repair kind of you know, libraries that kind of replace the new feature for all browsers. Do you have any experience with that? Yes, yes. Uh, modernizer uh, is also Shim. Um, modernizer is just great for doing that. Uh, in a lot of cases, it, I think uh, it's, it's great for really kind of IE compatibility and also compatibility uh, using the, the prefixes amongst all the different browsers, like the WebKit prefix. Um, uh, yes, continue using that stuff uh, until everybody decides to get rid of their prefixes. Does it help on mobile or? Sorry? Does it help on mobile too? Or is it just for? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I use Modernizer all the time on mobile. And a lot of cases uh, to accommodate for the different vendor prefixes. Um, and also see if the uh, features and functionalities are there. Modernizer gives you uh, a really good way to. Um, to, to probe <coughs> your user agent to detect which features are available or not. So definitely use modernizer. That's a very good question. So for the last year and a half, um, Firefox, Google, Opera, and I think that's it. Nope, that's all right. Uh, they've all been ganging up uh, together uh, to try to make the mobile web do whatever the native app can do. Um, I'm not quite sure why Apple hasn't been as hardcore in that mix. Maybe because they have that store. It was very exciting. Is Firefox has actually started to present where.
where they're at in this this modernizing of the mobile browser. This is a very long page. So what they did was they literally dissected a phone. And they said, all right, how can we make the web do everything needed to do? <laughs> and so everything you see in green, and I'll read it out quickly, um, is now available in Firefox beta. If you guys have Android devices, you guys can start using these. These are really cool. Um, so just to name a few, there's web telephony. Uh, you can actually, from your phone, use that to make calls uh, and access the native uh, devices ability to do that. There's web SMS. There is geolocation, which most of you guys probably are familiar with. Um, the battery API, I think that will be pretty huge because um, a lot of the graphics and animations uh, that, that are taking place on mobile devices kill the battery. Um, and I think there are a lot of ways you can use that battery API to uh, better load your or manage your resources. Um, also, there is Web Vibrator. So I guess you can use the web website to make your phone vibrate. Um, web NFS, that's near field communication. That's not done yet. I've tried most of these, and they're, they work great. I've used um, web proximity. That's where when you have your mobile phone, and you bring it up to your head, and you know, it's by your head. Um, then uh, the, the, there's four, though, of these that I'm super excited about. And those are the web audio API. How many of you guys have heard about that? A little bit? Cool. Uh, and then there's also the web uh, the Get Media Capture. Has anybody heard about that? Very cool. And there's also peer communication, which uh, enables connections between browser to browser uh, for data exchange. Um, and so what you can do with this, I have a demo. <clears throat> so a lot of these features are also available on your desktop. Um, you just have to go into Chrome. Maybe I'll show you. So you go into Chrome. You type Chrome, forward slash, forward slash, flags. And then you see all of these really, uh, are you guys familiar with this? Chrome, this is awesome. So all your browsers, if you type in Chrome, colon, forward slash, forward slash, flags, um, you'll actually see all a, a huge list of all these features that you can enable. And a lot of these features have to do with um, the new HTML5 and the new web APIs um, uh, that I just showed you on that device, or on that last slide. And so if you enable these, you can, you can do things. Here's the pure connection right here, which allows you to directly communicate in real time uh, back and forth between people. If you couple that with the, the Git Media user <laughs> input, you can actually take video from your mobile device, broadcast it live to another device, and, and back and forth and have a connection without plugins. Yes? Is your connection something separate from web sockets? Yes. Um, that's, that's a very good question. Web sockets uh, uh, deals with uh, more, I would say, primitive uh, data types, uh, whereas um, pure connection handles uh, buffering and use, use of some of the newer JavaScript um, data types that handle like for video and blobs and file, file systems and all that stuff. So the pure connection, I would say, is more so WebSockets on steroids. Okay. <laughs> um, WebSockets and web workers are, are also very huge, but um, let me show you this demo. So you might have seen something like this on the iPad, um, but now it's available to us on the web. And so when you're using Pure Connection um, and the Get User Media uh, 
new APIs, and you click allow, you'll get some. So this is just a web browser using the Git user media to capture the live video stream. And then I'm using Canvas to actually grab that information and read it. And then I'm then using 3JS to actually process the perspective. And so what it does is it actually follows my head around. And so these are some of the APIs that I just showed you that will, are soon to be released on, on the mobile browser. Um, so it will be on your iOS, iPad, Android tablets. Um, and this is just some of the, I think, really neat, exciting stuff that's coming out. Um, there's also the ability to synthesize your own audio. Um, there's the ability to process audio. There is uh, the ability to build apps that do anything from uh, being a guitar tuner to um, a live chat client with uh, interactive uh, web surfing. So, so there's a lot of very exciting things in store. Any questions on this? What about this red circle? So what I did was um, I was going to try to put a cube in there, and so when I put a cube in there, I realized it got very distorted. And so I put points in there to figure out why. And I figured out why it's because of really my math and how I'm, how I'm processing the perspective. So that is what's in store for the future. Yeah, I think the most promising are web RTC, web audio, web video, pure connection, and uh, something that I meant to tell you about is something called Inscripted. Has anybody here heard of Inscripted? Show of hands. Cool. Have you used it? Uh, so with um, a lot of these new data types that JavaScript has now, um, it's now possible to port different uh, uh, traditional software into JavaScript. So this would be porting over something like maybe like an OpenCV uh, face recognition uh, engine that they have in C++. So you can actually use EMScript now to port anything written in C++ or C um, to JavaScript. And so you can use that. So I'll show you a quick example of that, but I think it's pretty cool. There's this website called or there is this plugin called SpeakJS. And so what these guys did was they, um, they did was they took EMScripted and they took a, uh, a voice, uh, just text-to-speech uh, software, and they converted it over to JavaScript. So this is all JavaScript in the browser. So any of you guys out there who have C++ C skills, um, you'll be able to take some really neat uh, software and forge it to JavaScript. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, you can change pitch. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> anyway, you can have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> I guess I don't know. <laughs> 
Do you have it's just on the web, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know what it is. I think that uh, I think my demo killed my computer. <laughs> um, my computer's frozen. So you can actually use the local machine if you want to pull something like that. Oh no, that's okay. Uh, I'm pretty much done with the presentation. So what we went over was we went over a quick overview of the uh, user experience, um, how slow it is, uh, mobile rage. We also went over some of the ways to test and debug your website uh, using emulators, uh, remote tools, uh, remote labs, um, and the, the best choice of it all is the actual device. And then we went over optimization strategies using HTML5, uh, CSS3, and JavaScript. And finally, we covered some of the new stuff that we should be seeing at the end of the year for mobile devices. So with the um, with Opera, uh, Mozilla, and Google doing these things to advance their browser, are there any plans that you know of that they would make a port to iOS to get that in there, or like what's the status? Because like they've done the with IE, they've done that Google Frame. Right, so yeah. there's something that they're trying to do with iOS. Well, the good news is iOS uh, is uh, also developing some of these APIs alongside. Mm. Um, <clears throat> on the net, though, they just don't seem to be as friendly with revealing what they're working on or the time frames. Mm. Um, but they definitely are working with web audio. Um, in fact, a lot of this stuff's already in, in draft stage, um, and it's being driven primarily by Google, Firefox, and Opera. If you want to just quickly see what's the current state of play, you know, in terms of API availability and, and compatibility with certain emerging standards, the, the easiest quick look compatibility title is probably HTML, mobile HTML5.org. Just go mm -hmm. there. It's work in progress, but it's just good idea, quick roadmap. One thing I also want to ask about. So, if you're looking at CS3, say, background and chat. And stuff like that. How can we see the intensive? Have you ever seen any problems with using too much CSS3 and having it slow down because the processors are not Yes, I have. Um, good question. Uh, so the question was uh, with regard to like background shadows um, and using too much of that. Uh, does that affect the, the processor um, and the, the speed of how it renders? And the answer is yes. I uh, noticed that the more opacity that you have um, with the websites. Uh, the, the slower uh, speed and rendering that you get, especially with animation. Um, some of the tricks I've learned around that are, in some cases, using PNGs um, versus using CSS. Um, but CSS and opacity seem not to be too friendly with mobile. That's a good question. Yes? I have a question relating to uh, responsive design and, and the promise of, of having a single set of, of markup that is that is usable across desktop and mobile. Um, what is your experience there? And, and uh, a, a lot of the, the points here were of, of simplifying the markup and, and, and adapting to the slower network speeds. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, that I would know exactly when to, when to go for an for a independent mobile site with, a, with its own markup and where to, to approach a responsive design. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, well, part of that depends, I think, on the application. Uh, but I think in most cases, uh, the technology is uh, available and ready for mobile um, to handle uh, what you want to do on the desktop. So, so I, I always uh, I'd approach it with, with a mobile first approach and just jump right in. Uh, part of that is I'm biased because I, I think mobile is the future. But, uh, um, you have to look at your strategy, and you have to, to or I'm sorry, you have to look at what you had, and then figure out if it's something that you have to progressively enhance, uh, or if this is something that you would just need to start from scratch. And a lot of people, in my experience, a lot of people start from scratch with mobile websites. Yes. Uh, good Google introduced an HTTP extension, Speedy, S-P-D-Y. I see it on the desktop, 
you know, does it have any place in mobile? Does it help? You know, I, I've seen it recently too. I don't know that much about it, but I do know um, that on some of the little sites that I've been on, they talk about it. So, sorry I can't answer that, but um, Spidey is, is powerful. It's, it's, uh, from what I understand, it's, it's a way for um, performance optimization using HTTP polling. Um, instead of parallel connections, it does it all on just one connection with compression. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it then. No. Um, sorry about that. Going back to the uh, uh, web app uh, compatibility, uh, how are they ma managing security? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, a lot of the reasons why these uh, APIs aren't enabled yet is because they're still working out the final issues with security. Um, however, uh, they promise to solve that by the end of the year when they release all of this public. Um, how they're doing it, I'm not quite sure. Uh, they seem very confident that it will be secure. <laughs> I don't know how they're doing it, though. Right. Yep. Hi. Um, so I know this, this question sort of depends on what kind of client you're trying to serve, but how aggressive are you in terms of, I guess, abandoning to some extent legacy support? One more time. How aggressive are you in terms of pushing like the abandonment of legacy support for your clients? Uh, where do you draw the line? Of uh, 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 legacy support. support. Yeah, that's for legacy browsers. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, very. I guess I don't know. Uh, so part of, part of the issue is that I see sort of this like the web moves faster than people make phone purchases. Like some people make phone purchases like every six months or so. There's some people that purchase phone like once a year, once every two years, once every three years, right? So that means like you have a lot of people using old droids or next phones. And that's Android 2.3, right? So that means they don't get a lot of CSS3, they don't even have SVG support. And if we want to make something that's really cutting edge, do we just cut out everyone that's not running Android 3? Like where do you make that distinction? Uh, I think that might depend on, on your analytics uh, and how people are using your, your tool um, and how people will be affected by that. Um, typically, you, you could go about doing a lot of this, though, uh, with the understanding of, of what will happen in those browsers and how it will degrade. Um, a lot of these degrade nicely amongst browsers. Um, if you are dealing with uh, a huge chunk of clients who um, are using the older systems, I'd probably uh, stay away from some of the, the more advanced web APIs, but um, there's nothing really you can do to, to force users who are you know, using their browsers to, to jump on board. Well, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs>